Oh, yay, lots of managers in the room. Oh, and lots of new managers. Okay, great. Okay, great. So hopefully um, this will be helpful. Um, and Amelia, do you want to sort of officially start us? Is it time? Am I early? Yeah, looks like it's 10 o'clock, so we can go ahead and get started. Um, and I'll be around to moderate all of the sessions today, so if anyone um, has questions about the Zoom or um, slides, we do have, let me share um, a link to a folder with the slides for today if you want to sort of take notes with the, the slides or follow along. Um, you should be able to access it through that link in the chat. Um, but we'll get started. The session goes until 11. Um, and um, I'll go ahead. I don't have anything formal to say. So Leslie, go ahead and get started. OK, good morning, everyone. Uh, really excited to be here. I love the opportunity to engage with my colleagues in this way. So I want to thank NC Live and specifically Amelia for hosting today. Um, my name is Leslie Mason. I am currently the library director uh, of Carteret County Public Library System, um, which is out on the coast. It did not snow today. I just want everybody to know, and I knew it wasn't gonna snow because I'm from the mountains. We can smell snow, it wasn't gonna snow. So um, I have been a manager for almost 10 years. I've been in library service almost somewhere between eight, 18, like 15 to 18 years. I've been doing this a long time. Um, and uh, most notably, um, I was a mover shaker, which was really exciting. Um, and I only mention that because I always think, wow, look at these amazing people doing these amazing things. And then um, they just seem like these people over there somewhere and they're not ever, you know, we are doing amazing things in our industry, especially now. And um, I think, everybody should put themselves out there a little bit more for these things that um, we get recognized for in our field. Uh, I've worked previously um, at Caldwell County. I was the library director at Caldwell County on the western side of the state. Before that, I was at DC Public Library in Washington, DC, where I was um, the youth services manager. And um, I worked in various branches throughout the district before that. Um, I was at Washington County, which is in um, the skinny part of Maryland. Uh, I was a teen services coordinator and children's librarian there. Before that, I started um, in library service at Enoch Pratt Free Library in Baltimore, where I was a library assistant. Um, started off part time and sort of worked my way up through through the ranks, so to speak. Um, so that's a little background on me. I guess it makes people think that I have the ability to talk about such things like management and library service. Um, I'm just really pleased and humbled that so many people are participating this morning. And hopefully um, you, you'll kind of glean a couple of little things this morning. And um, I also want to open up the chat as we get started. And I don't know. Um, Amelia, do you need me to share my slides or share my screen or open up something? Um, I'm, I'm happy to share if you want me to. Um, yeah, that's probably better. I have a slow, okay. I have a slow me, computer, so I don't want I'll, to check. Okay. Um, oh, I like Holly Jones's picture. That's cute. Are we up? I can't tell if we can see slides or not. No, I'm seeing those. Okay. Sorry, just give me one second. Oh, sorry. Um, so while the slides are coming up, um, I want you guys to start thinking about and put it in the chat because I'm going to go back and sort of review um, on some things and I want you guys to see the answers with each other. Um, why are you why are you doing this? <laughs> what um, what brought you to management? Why did you want to take this next step? Um, sometimes people identify themselves. It does look great, actually. Um, 
people identify themselves as like, you know what, I'm really ready for management. I want to move forward. So sometimes people feel that greatness in them. And sometimes we have greatness thrust upon us because we have a boss that says, hey, you're get congratulations. You're going to be the new children's coordinator. Yay. And you're just kind of like deer in headlights look. So um, just let me know how, what kind of brought you here and into your current role. Um, and if you're thinking about management, maybe why? You know, in a good way, not, oh my God, why? Um, no, in a good way, like what, what's kind of prompting this next step for you? Um, and um, those of you who are doing this work, um, you know, how many direct reports do you have? We, I should have asked that before because I think that does matter when we start talking about this sort of thing. Um, and I, I want to be very clear about my goal for today. Um, I want to give you tips and tools that help you start sort of on this path. Um, being a good manager and a great leader is, is not instantaneous. It doesn't happen. I have my own staff are watching. They will tell you I mess up a lot. Um, so it's a process. And so hopefully um, some of these things that I have learned will get you on that path faster. Uh, these are a lot of things that I found out the hard way, and I would never want somebody else to have to kind of make that same mistake. So that's really my goal with being here today. Um, you know, library management is really different from other industries in the sense that there, something happens when you get your MLS, people are just sort of, especially if you're already in a particular system, there's this expectation or this unfounded correlation that, oh, well, then you want to be in management. And that's unfair. It's an unfair um, assumption to make about people. And it's also, you know, interesting because I don't know of any MLS programs that incorporate personnel management classes. They teach us about collection management. They saw a good ones teach you about budget. Um, great ones teach you a little bit about facilities. And heart, I don't hear of any that focus on personnel. But some magical thing happens out there in the world, like, ding, now you're ready to be manager, you have that paper. And I think this is what has brought us all to this point. It's like, okay, well, here I am now, now what do I do? So let's kind of review some of the chats. Oh, 7 4, okay. Yeah, some, yeah, I magically got a new title in my email footer one day. Um, yeah, took a chance. I did that too. Um, yeah, gosh, a lot of the same sorts of, of situations where you're just kind of like, well, you know, I thought here I am. Um, so that's really interesting. And I, I encourage everybody to sort of scroll through, scroll through the chats. So, um, you know, moving on, I gave um, to the next slide, I, I gave a presentation before about um, middle management and leading from the middle. And I talked about some of these myths and misconceptions about management. And I wanted to touch on them again, because I think what you're going to see in the chat is going to reflect here in, in this slide. I know it resonated for me. I very much thought, you know, I was getting kind of stagnant. I've been doing this for a while. I, I felt like I, there was, I've done everything I can do in children's services. The um, and I thought, well, I really want to be more impactful. I want to do more. And I inappropriately equated that with, well, so I should be in management, right? Like that's, that's where the magic happens. Um, and so I just, I just made this assumption that that was going to be my next logical step. And I definitely fell into this trap of, well, of inexperience. Like, oh, well, when I'm in charge of the summer reading program, then I, it, we can do away with some of this these weird registration forms that drive us crazy. Um, you know, if I'm, um, if I'm the youth services manager, then all of the children's folks will kind of buy into this um, understanding of how we program. And I very much fell into a lot of these myths. I even fell into some of this when I ended up being a, a library director. I was like, well, um, you know, I'll, I'll figure it out when I get there. Cause you know, let me just let me just try it. See what happens. Um, and it can be trial by fire can be great. Um, it can also be painful. And I, I think it's really important to understand that 
um, being in management um, is a whole nother set of skills and circumstances. And that when you understand what brought you here, you can start doing the hard work of finding more out about yourself. Um, I, I hope that we understand too, that even though we use the term management and leadership sometimes interchangeably, they are not the same thing. And the skill set that you need for each of these often overlap um, and complement, but they are absolutely not the same. Um, and so hopefully after this session, you'll feel a little bit more empowered to understand the difference and understand how you can use those different skills. Um, you can use your leadership skills, you can develop your leadership skills to influence and do better with your management style. So I know, you know, if you're seeing yourself in any of these, that's a good thing um, because you're, you're sort of on that path already. Um, some of these might be, oh my gosh, I didn't even realize. But yeah, a lot of this, if you can recognize these as myths, um, it will save yourself a lot of heartache um, going forward. So um, on the next slide, I really want to emphasize that you can't do this work without understanding who you are um, and really being introspective. This work, when done successfully, takes a lot of self-knowledge and introspective um, look inside, being introspective, and that's hard. It's difficult. It's arduous. It doesn't happen overnight. Um, but if you can be patient and set aside your own ego and, I, you know, you know, ego um, in the sense that putting yourself in the middle of the process, if you can take yourself out of the middle and put your staff person there, um, it will really shift how you do your job. And the only way you can do that is to completely know yourself. Um, these questions will help you start that process. I didn't fully answer these questions at the beginning of my management career and it got in the way and actually caused a lot more um, a lot more conflict than than needed to be because I went from this place of all of these myths where I thought well all these magical things are going to happen because I have this new job or I have this new title and um, you also put your own assumptions into your work and you expect those things that you know about your work to also show up in your staff. So if you understand your own triggers, if you understand your own motivation, if you um, are confident in yourself, you're going to be able to do your work better um, because it's going to allow yourself to open up to, to your staff and be able to be empathetic and understand these answers for them and that it's okay that they're different from your own. Um, you know, if you understand your triggers and you understand your own assumptions um, and you're perfectly comfortable with them, when you're triggered by a staff person or a situation, you're gonna be able to recognize it faster, put it to the side and get to the core of the issue instead of kind of being in this middle ground of, of emotional uncertainty or, or um, insecurity about a topic. So I really think if we all take the hard, long, hard look at ourselves and start the work with ourselves, we're gonna be able to give more to our staff. Um, let's see, I have lots of notes for you guys today. Um, you know, I, and again, I wanna reiterate that, you know, the reason why we're here and the reason why we're doing the work is not the reason that your coworker is here and doing the work. And that's really important to know. I, I had a staff person who was struggling. They just seemed disinterested. Um, they, their performance was kind of lacking um, and they just lost a little bit of something. And I was new to the position. And so I didn't know them very well. And I thought, you know what, um, I'm going to sit down with them. We're going to, we're going to, have this really great meeting, we're gonna bond, we're gonna find some commonality, and I'm gonna use that commonality to build and grow this individual. And because I knew, even though we were very different in a lot of ways, I knew that we were gonna be able to come together. And I thought, okay, so we're gonna have this meeting and um, 
I asked the staff person, you know, what do you love most about your job? Because I thought this is it. Like they're going to talk about all these altruistic like visions of I help people and I'm defending democracy. It's just going to be this beautiful love fest of libraries, right? And we're going to come together and it's going to be great. And um, the answer that I got back was, oh, well, you know, it's really close to my house. And I was like, oh, crap. Like, um, wow. So, and I had to like, ooh, think on my feet real quick because I had gone through every scenario and every answer except that one. And in that moment, I realized this is my issue. This is not their issue. That's a very legitimate reason to like your job. That's actually a fantastic reason. And in that moment, I couldn't connect with that. So, you know, I sort of kind of took a left turn and took the conversation in a different direction. It was very productive conversation. We got to a great place, but I had not taken myself out of that conversation. And the minute you can understand that everybody brings something different to work and you have to meet them there, it's going to help. So you need to understand yourself better so that you can understand your staff better. Um, so moving on, while you're thinking about yourself, um, it's important to really um, think about and moving on to the next slide, this idea of interpersonal and soft skills. Most people call it soft skills. They're interpersonal skills. When you start thinking about what you bring to your work and the strengths and weaknesses that you have, really try to tie them to some of, some of these interpersonal skills. I mean, if you Google interpersonal skills, it, there's a list of like 150 things uh, and they're all vital and they're all important. And I think when you can think about yourself and put them in these categories, it's going to help you identify certain managerial and leadership styles that you can develop in yourself. Um, some people say that you can't learn soft skills and I disagree with that. Um, I think you can. I think um, it takes a certain amount of emotional intelligence and um, when I saw that there was going to be a session on emotional intelligence, I, I, you know, I'm not going to get into that because it is its own session. It, and I think it's two sessions even. And it is. I mean, emotional intelligence is vital. Um, again, it's a really great way to learn about yourself. Um, but I did want to touch on some of these specifically active listening and caring because they really influence the other pieces of this puzzle. I have gotten some really great constructive criticism from my staff and some of the best have come from staff that I've had difficult relations with and I had a staff person tell me um, one time that she wished I were warmer and um, that was a trigger for me because I have been told that I am um, you know all of those things that women here in leadership um, she's you know, she's mean, she's, you know, she's hard to get along with, um, all of those things. And so it has been a trigger for me. And in that moment, I could feel the trigger. And I thought, you know what, um, you know, sh what she means is, or what I think she means. And so I asked her, you know, do, am I not available enough? Right? That was how I internalized that. Do you need me to be more available? Um, because I'm not warm. I am not warm. I am it's just not in me. Um, so I try and I took that criticism very much to heart. And so in turn, my way of being warm, because I'm not like, I'm not a kindergarten teacher. I mean, I'm a children's librarian, so I, I love my children, but I am the Miss Mason, you know, like says, um, I am the, you know, I'm not the friend librarian, I'm the other adult in their life. Um, and so I, I took that as I need to be more available. And so, and sometimes outside of work. So my idea for that was, well, let's have time to socialize with me um, outside of a work setting. So um, I offered, we had a little coffee shop and I said, okay, um, I'm going to have, I'm going to have a coffee break before work. So eight o'clock, meet me if you want to meet me downtown. I'll, I'll buy everybody some coffee. We can socialize. Um, and then, you know, we didn't, we don't have to report till 8, 845. So we had, you know, half an hour to just sort of meet. And that was my response to that. Um, but again, it was because I very much knew my own triggers. I very much was trying to actively listening to what the real problem, you know, her real concern and problem was, and then tried to come up with a solution. Um, 
So again, that could have been that could have been a really hard conversation between she and I, but you know, I was able to really hear what it was she needed from me. Um, and I, I want to say this, and if you don't take anything else away from this hour that we have together, I really want it to be this. It is your job. It is solely up to you to figure out how to effectively communicate with your staff. What does that mean? It means that you have to figure out, learn and implement the communication preference of each individual staff member. Let me rephrase. It is not your staff's job to adapt to your communication style. It's your job to adapt to them. And that was the hardest lesson I've ever learned. I'm still learning it. Um, I send emails. I write memos. I have a staff page that has policy and procedure. And I very much expect people to be self-motivated and be critical thinkers and review that and be on top of things. And that's not fair because that is not how everybody communicates. And it falls back into that myth of, oh, well, if I'm the leader, everybody's going to listen and everybody's going to follow. And that doesn't work. And this showed up um, in an instance where a staff person who had been given um, a, you know, a workflow change and, but it wasn't quite working out. So, um, you know, another manager and I sat down with this person and they said, yeah, but you didn't tell me. And we're like, but we have this lovely flow chart. <laughs> Look at this lovely flow chart that we have. And this right here, this little arrow is where we're having a little problem. And she, she was very honest with like, you didn't tell me. And she had to say it three times before I realized, oh my God. I didn't tell her. I didn't tell her. I just said, here's this lovely flow chart and here's three emails and here they're all time stamped. She, she needs me to tell her. Duh, like, duh. So of course, of course, I, met, I made a note, like we need to meet when, when there is a change in workflow or a change in policy or a huge organization, we need to meet with her. She has to hear it. Um, duh. I mean, it seems it seems so simple now, but of course, in the moment when you're thinking, "Oh, we're going to make this quick change. We're just going to let everybody know." Check, check, check. Mm -mm, no, that was that was absolutely on us. We had to tell her. Um, this is a hard lesson to learn, and I think. Um, Yes, staff need to read your emails. Yes, they need to see the notes that you make. Um, but ultimately, at the end of the day, you're the boss, yes, but it's going to land on your desk if that workflow process isn't wa working smoothly. It's going to fall on your desk if there is um, a policy change that isn't being implemented in a uniform manner. Um, it's going to be on your desk if you have a staff person that's underperforming and you will save yourself time, energy, and a severe headache if you just figure out now how your staff need to receive your information. Um, and it, that really does tie into that emotional intelligence piece. Um, I also cannot recommend enough crucial conversations. Buy yourself a copy. It'll be the best investment you ever make. It has a red and white cover. Um, I'll send out a resource page at, hopefully very soon some some of the some of the articles that I had when I checked them the links were weren't good anymore and that's a bad look for a librarian so um, but please understand that one piece if you get nothing else out of my presentation today understand that um, we'll move into the next slide and I'm just going to touch this is going to be an overwhelming slide so brace yourself um, yeah so here <laughs> this is a lot but I'm only doing this so you see the rabbit hole you can um, get into with when you start like Googling and researching like leadership styles, management theory, you get all of this kind of stuff and, and you can easily spend hours just clicking away like and, and you're going to get overwhelmed. So I want to touch on some of these briefly. These are ones that I kind of lean back to time and time again. I know they're kind of small, but um, I'm going to just kind of touch on it 
just so that um, you can kind of get a sense of it. So the top two grids, the top two square things, really deal with um, tasks, people who are task driven, people who, who are motivated by getting things done and having a checklist versus your staff that are highly motivated by um, personal interaction and that connection with the patron. So we're talking about your staff people who are really good at shelf reading and shelving and they shelved three carts and yes, I'm great versus the staff person who knows Miss Mildred's grandchildren, knows which Miss Julia book she's on and which one she needs next. I mean, these are two very different staff people. Both bring so much to your organization and both of those people need very different leadership and management styles. So you can use these grids to figure out the type of project you need to work with them on, the type of person they are, and what kind of leadership or management style they need from you in order to be successful. So um, that's where these kind of come into play. Um, you know, some of the things to remember and the six styles of leadership, which is the circle in the middle on the bottom part of the slide, those very much overlap with the leadership style matrix on top of it. So we're talking about leadership styles that include include being autocratic um, or um, oh, what's the it's it's not a negative one, but it, commanding. So autocratic and commanding are just like do as I say. Uh, uh, uh. Um, these are dangerous but much needed these are crisis scenario leadership styles a hurricane is coming i have to make a decision um, this is what we're doing um, th those are good and needed um, use them sparingly and always circle back after and include your staff on a debrief on what happened and why you did it because it is very he heavy-handed um, i call it pulling the boss card um, sometimes with my staff, I'll be like, look, I got to pull my director card. And I, I don't try to do that because it's not healthy. But sometimes it just I know things I know what this is going to mean down the road. And so I'm going to have to do a hard stop on this. So um, just be aware of that. There's um, visionary benevolence. This is, um, you know, allowing people to sort of see bigger picture things. This can be really important if you're trying to bring people in on um, organizational change. Um, I'm trying to keep an eye on time because I could, this could be a whole nother session. I could really talk about this as a whole nother session. So just understand that there's these different styles. You know, there's participatory, democratic, where you're having these work sessions. Those are great when you're involved. So um, you're kind of leading the discussion. You're kind of, maybe you have your own ideas on how you want things to go. So maybe you're trying to lead people into a, maybe agreeing with what you have already decided or um, you really are soliciting feedback and you really want this to be team driven. Um, so those are important. Um, when you talk about consensus building, um, building a team, these are all really important and it is very much dependent on what you're trying to accomplish. If, you, if you're trying to accomplish, um, trying to think, you have to re-barcode your entire collection because you're, you're coming on to NC Cardinal, right? Um, and now you have you figure out that, you know, some counties already using your um, barcode set up. <laughs> so you have to rebarcode. Right. So you need to be a pace setter. You need to you need to focus on the task. And in order to do that, you can use the grid to figure out what kind of um, managerial style or leadership style you need to use. So those that's something to sort of think about if you're if you're doing a strategic plan. Um, that you need to be visionary, you need to be um, affiliative, you need to kind of bring a consensus together. Um, so that's how you can sort of use these different tools to focus yourself. The path goal theory leadership down there in the in the corner, um, this is great. If you are not, uh, if you don't have smart goals for your staff, if you're not allowing staff to participate in sort of their end of the year evaluation and some of the things they're being measured on and against, you're going to have a hard time getting them motivated, regardless of, of how they're driven, whether they're people driven or task driven. They need a chance to participate. And that path goal theory will help you get there if you're not already in doing that. So I very much encourage uh, looking at that. Um, in the far corner, um, the uh, not the six styles of leadership, but the other sort of colorful circle is transformational leadership. 
it's a very, it's a relatively new, considering some of these other things are from the 60s. And I think transformational leadership started in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, and that that's sort of the holy grail of leadership, right? Um, you're modeling the behavior, you're, um, you're challenging preconceived processes, you're bringing in a vision, you're empowering your staff. This is like the holy grail of leadership style and, and where I think, I think it naturally leads itself to our work. I think we're all by nature of what we do transformational. I think libraries are transformational in general. Um, that's a whole other presentation. Um, maybe, a, maybe I put that as a poster session somewhere, but, um, and again, tip of the iceberg. So what, wh why I'm showing you all of this is so um, make a plan for yourself once a week, choose one of these or another one that you found because there's 500 others out there. Um, pick three or four journal articles about this, read them, um, you know, take them in, write notes about them, then put it away, right? Next week, go on to the next thing. And when it's time to manage a project, sit down with a person, set up year end evaluations, go back to your notes because that's the, your notes are going to be what you gleaned from, from these tools. Those are the things that are going to resonate with you. At some point during my ramblings about this slide, you thought about a staff person. Oh, I have that staff person. So go back and think, you know what? That staff person really needs me to be a little more, um, needs me to be a little more affili affiliated, right? They, they need um, that extra touch. So make your notes and then put it aside and, and come back and revisit often. Um, so it, it's a lot. I, I, I can sort of, I, I know I feel overwhelmed when I, when it's time for me to go back and revisit and relearn and recoach. Um, and so just understand, I understand that, um, but it's an investment in yourself and it's an investment in your staff and it will ultimately save you a lot of time and energy in the future. So, uh, yeah. All right. So the next slide. Oof. So in, and I, I told Devin this when I was talking with her, I quickly realized that we probably need an entire session on coaching and counseling and, um, and disciplinary action with staff as part of maybe this managerial or leadership um, workshop that they're doing. And I, I am the odd duck. Um, if, you, if you ever talk to anybody that's ever worked with me at a, at a leader, at a manager level, my other um, managers in DC, they were astonished that I, I like, I love like coaching, counseling, discipline. I don't, I don't like that term, but we really don't have, I call it coaching and counseling. Um, disciplinary action is a whole nother thing um, that I also welcome. Um, every time you interface with a staff person, it's the opportunity for them to grow and develop or to, or to be more mindful of expectation or to get clarity. I always see it as a positive. I always bring a positive note to the conversation um, because ultimately Everyone in that room during that session is focused on the employee and their and the organization and doing better. And if that's if that's the mentality you're coming with, it's going to be good no matter what. Even if it even if it's not good at the end, it's going to be good. So I want to talk about. I, I did want to have one slide about this because I know a lot of people are coming to this session. Like, how do I deal with? people that I used to work with, but now I manage, and now they're sort of acting out. How do I deal with uh, uh, somebody who has been here for 20 years and they're starting to not show up on time? They're not, they're not doing, they're not pulling their weight. Um, this, is, this is a touch point to get you started on that. Um, when you are talking with your employees and your staff and your team, make sure they know if this is a coaching and counseling session, or is this a disciplinary action? Because here's the here's the key to this. Once you start this process, if the employee isn't absolutely clear, it's like you didn't do it at all. Um, so you have to be very clear um, and and write it down. Like have have a almost have a script ready. Hey, you know Joe Smith. I don't have anybody named Joe Smith. Um, 
I, you know, I'm sitting down with you today because we really need to have a conversation about your attendance, uh, and I'm really concerned about it. Um, now, this is just a preliminary conversation because I want to know what we can do to get you to work on time, right? So, because like at, at this point, they're freaking out, right? You can see that they're freaking out. Their body language is like they're all tense. Their eyes are big, you know, if quiver lip, you know, I get a lot of quiver lip. Um, I don't think I'm that scary, but I'm scary. Um, so I'm here, you're getting the quiver lip and you're just like, this is not a disciplinary action. This is a coaching and counseling session. I want to figure out how we can get you to work on time. And then they're just like, oh, okay, okay. Um, so make sure they know what's happening. If this is, if this is a disciplinary action, you need to lead with that. You know, Joe Smith, we're sitting down with you today because you're getting an oral reprimand about your behavior at the desk last Tuesday. Freak out, freak out, freak out, right? And, you know, so be very clear about why you're there because if, if they think, oh, this was no big deal, and then you circle back around and you're trying to fire them, they'll be like, whoa, 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 this is the first time I'm hearing about this. Um, remember when I talked to you, you know, a month ago? Oh, but you said it wasn't a big deal. Like it was just, a, no, 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 right? You have to be very clear. Great example of setting the tone. Um, Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah. Decide on the time and place. So I, there was a question about um, how much information you give them before the talk. It, the, you have to know your staff person. Um, I had a staff person and who just anytime I said, hey, can you pop into my office? She was just like, I'm getting fired. I'm getting fired. And it's like, no, you're not. I need, you know, I, I want to talk to you about your outreach tomorrow. <laughs> like it's. You're not getting fired. So sometimes you have to make sure you're telling them you're not getting fired, but we do need to have a conversation about your performance. Um, they'll still be a little, just, you're not getting fired. Nobody's getting fired. I, I also tell staff, you can't, I mean, technically it's an Apple state, so I could just fire you, but that's not how it works. Like there's a lot of paperwork that goes into firing someone and it's, it's not just like, hey, you know what? I don't like your socks. You're out of here. Um, so I, I do make an appointment with them. I, I try to, here's the other thing, time and place, right? You don't want to kick off your day first thing in the morning on a Monday with any kind of disciplinary or coaching, counseling, anything um, until you're really good at it. Um, people take these things unbelievably personally. It's going to affect their whole day. You might have to send them home. Um, try to schedule it at the end of the day, give them the information that, Hey, we are, we're going to, we're going to meet and talk. Um, we're going to have a great productive conversation, but, um, you know, it, it needs to be a one-on-one -on -one or, you know, their immediate supervisor if, or another supervisor. Um, but try to keep it positive, but, but let them know. Um, yeah, don't, don't, don't leave it open ended. I will say there is, um, there is this idea of you can do like pass by coaching. Like um, I do this sometimes with like, Hey, I know, you know, I know she had your cell phone out. Is everything okay? Because I, I have a strict, no, no, I don't want to see your personal cell phone. I don't want to see it. First of all, million, re million reasons. I don't want to see it. I don't want the patrons to see it. So if I see one out, I try to do a casual, like, is everything okay? Cause some people have kids and they have sick parents and you know, they need, they need to be with their phone, but I, you know, we need to have that communication of like, yeah, my son is home alone and he's sick and oh, okay. Well, I hope he feels better. You know, maybe just put it in your pocket. Um, that sort of thing. Um, I would make a note because if it becomes a repetitive issue with the cell phone, then I'm going to need the documentation, but, um, it is important to give them enough information that they, they can come ready and then they're not surprised, but you don't want to get them riled up before the actual meeting. Typically people know they're going to say they don't know. People know, people know if they're slacking, people know if they're late to work, people know if they're not. I mean, so, so you can acknowledge that we, we probably do need this to be its own thing, but um, you have, you have to be unemotional when you have these conversations, which is very hard. But I, I, re, I give myself a pep talk for this. It's business. It's not personal. It's business. It's not personal. It's not about me. It's not about me personally. I have had staff tell me it was my fault that they are whatever. Um, and that's, that's hard. 
but I have to, this isn't a, this isn't about me. I'm just the catalyst for whatever it is that's bothering them or whatever is keeping them, you know, from meeting expectation. Um, so I have, I have to hear it and be empathetic. Um, but really manage, like, we're not going off the rails on, you know, whatever is happening in your life that you're bringing to work. You know, there's no crying in baseball. Okay. Um, this is business. It's not personal. I, you know, if, if you have an employee that's having a breakdown, acknowledge that, be empathetic. I see that, that you're, that this is really hard for you. Um, do you need a minute? Do you want to take a break? Do you, you know, do you want to step outside and like, you know, collect your thoughts and then we can come back and continue this. Um, do you, do we need to take a break and maybe revisit this tomorrow? Because um, I see that this is a lot for you and I, I don't want to overwhelm you right now. Right. Um, so that's being empathetic, you know, empathetic is like, I am so sorry that your cat died and you've just not been able to like get it together to come to work for the past week and a half. You know, that's not being empathetic. Um, so just be careful of, of that trap too. Uh, map out your conversation. You only get one chance at this. And if you have to, if you're sitting down talking with somebody about their attendance and their performance, and you don't get to the performance part, you only get to the attendance part. That's it. Like, you know, you're going to have to, you're going to have to wait for another instance of um, them not meeting expectation to have that conversation because then you're just, you're picking on me. I can't do anything right. I mean, it's a spiral. So if you have two points that you have to talk to that employee about, you better write it down and, and say, um, look, you know, I have two things we really need to cover today. So um, I want to let you know, we're going to talk about your attendance and we're going to talk about your, um, your performance expectations. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Um, give them plenty of time to talk. Never, never interrupt them. I don't care if they start talking about their great, great grandma's uh, comforter, you let them get it out because you're never going to be able to move forward until they have completely exhausted whatever it is they're holding and bringing to the conversation. Lots of nodding, lots of concern face, unless we're getting into like hour four of this, um, let them talk it out eight times out of 10, they will talk themselves into agreeing with you. And yes, so you're right. I have, you know, I just haven't been bringing my best self to work. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm glad that we got, we were able, you know, to get this addressed, right? And it's going to take them some time. That's hard too, to manage that because they're going to get off topic. You got to get the train back on the track. Take notes. When the employee, when the employee is getting ready to have their say, Say, you know what, I'm, if it's okay with, I'm going to take some notes on this because I really want to get what you're telling me so I can find some ways that we can, that we can be helpful. Okay. And, and refer back to them. Okay. Just so we're clear, you know, you're having a hard time because you don't have the right supplies that you need for your programs. Okay. I'm going to write that down. Right. Um, trying to scroll down here in the chat too. I don't want to, if there's anything here we want to get, um, you need to be prepared to offer concrete solutions and a timeline. If you are coming to a coaching, you know, you know, touch point conversation, getting your staff back on track, or if it's a disciplinary action and you don't have a solution, like what are you even doing there? Um, attendance, because that's a neat, that's a big one and kind of an easy one. Okay, so you know, I've noticed that you've been consistently late for the past two weeks. Um, what kind of schedule accommodation? Could, could we come up with to get you to work on time? Um, you know, what, what's happening that, you know, you, you had great attendance. Is there something that's happening um, that, you know, you're not able to get to work on time? You know, do you need, do you need FMLA? Um, it's, in, FMLA is intermittent. Is that something that we could utilize for you? You know, they're gonna tell you, you know, what I really need is a babysitter that shows up on time. You know what, we have EAP. If you, if you're in an accounting agent, if you're in a county library system, you you have EAP. Um, if you don't know what it is, talk to your HR people. It's an employee assistance program. It is not just for disciplinary action. It's for everything. It's not just ther free therapy, although it is th free therapy and we all should be having therapy right now. Um, we are dealing with a collective trauma on many levels. So call your EAP people. Um, they also do, um, they help you buy a house. They get you. They help you connect with a bank. 
They help you find a babysitter. They help you find long-term care facilities for your sick parents. I mean, they do it all. So EAP, um, but off, have something, bring something to the table because they're just going to be like, oh, no. Um, and that then the conversation's over and give them a timeline. Okay, so we're gonna do we're gonna do X, Y, Z and um, we're gonna review it for uh, for about three weeks and then we're gonna come back and see if that if that worked or if we need to try something else, right? Um, give your chance the employees to buy into what's happening. If, you know, get, let them have a way, let them see the light at the end of the tunnel, give them the way out. Show them that if they follow, you know, these solutions and this timeline, that, that everything is going to get better. This is a path to success. This is not a path to departure. I mean, it can be, but, you know, ultimately your very first conversation about this is to make them successful. Firing people is hard. Nobody wants to do it. I don't want to fill out that paperwork. You don't want me to fill out that paperwork. It's much easier to reset expectation and get those folks back on. There's a reason they're with you. You just need to find it, get them reacquainted with it, um, and you'll you'll be able to be successful. Um, yes, I, yeah. If if people need to go home, these things are hard. Um, give them space if they need an extra break. Don't schedule it on a day where they've got already have a lot of things going on. Um, you know, don't do it. Praise in public, criticize in private. Um, constructive criticism only, please. We've all we've all had horrible things happen to us from a boss who wasn't sensitive to having these conversations. Um, always come with positive intent, even if you're firing somebody. Um, I've coached people out of this profession, and they were thrilled about it. Um, you know, just having a conversation about why are you doing this work, what do you like, and then finding out that what you like can happen in other places. Um, you know, lot, lots of my children's people are now school media specialists, I'm just telling you, because they weren't getting what they needed from public librarianship and they're thriving in a school media um, environment. So, you know, it, it can't, it's always gonna be positive no matter what happens. And if you come to these sessions with that in mind, you're gonna, you're gonna do better. So yes, that should have been its own presentation. So, um, Let's move on to the next one. So for folks that are now managing their coworkers, their work friends, um, this is a tough one. This could also probably be its own session, but my best advice for you is to acquaint yourself fully with the principles of influence. It used, now it's called principles of ethical influence. I guess we're not trying to get people to commit crimes. So we wanna be ethical about our influence. But um, if you follow this guideline and these principles, it will really help you with the transition from colleague to manager. Um, you, you're gonna be able to set yourself up for success. You're gonna be able to bring the team together. You're gonna to demonstrate why naturally, if you follow this, you're going to demonstrate naturally why you were selected for the position. You're not going to have to defend yourself. You're going to, your authority is going to shine through your professionalism, your industry knowledge. Um, those things are going to happen naturally. And then that person will be on their own path to acceptance. And um, you're going to be able to bring them in um, because you're going to, you're going to be consistent. You're going to um, bring them in as part of the team. You're going to form a consensus. You're going to be able to highlight their strengths and how they can inform you. Um, you're giving, you're allowing yourself to shine and you're able to sort of bring it back to the team and, and get them on your bus. Um, it really does set, set the stage. Um, I think um, especially sort of in that authority area, um, that's really important for us when we're looking at uh, managing a new team or people that we know in a different type of, of atmosphere and environment. Um, I think this is how you develop your strengths. Um, you know, this idea of fake it till you make it, that will get you pretty far. Um, but I want, I, here's another thing I really want you to sort of own and accept and I, it's, this took me a while too. You don't have to have an answer right then. When your staff come to you with everything, that's a really important question. I'm glad you brought that to my attention. I, I wanna sit with that a little bit um, and I'll get back to you tomorrow with, with, a, with a complete answer. Um, but do that, right? You have to be consistent. If you say, so say um, I'll get back to you next week. 
Um, give yourself time. Give yourself space. You do. I'm giving you permission. You do not have an have to have an answer in the moment every time staff have a question. There's there's that's not in the rule book anywhere. So use that. Um, it will make you um, it will make you more trustworthy. It will it will bring confidence from your staff. They're like, wow, she's really going to think about you know what I brought to her. Oh, okay, great, right? Um, it also brings in that idea of scarcity, like, mm, do I really need to bring this to her? Because, you know, I know she's going to take the time to deliberate it. Maybe I can figure this out on my own. So it really, like, you, when you have that influence over your team, it's really going to help um, through that transitional process. So um, learn lots of, and I think this moves on to sort of like final thoughts, because we are kind of moving right along. Um, I can't stress enough, find a mentor. Um, and if you can, not somebody at a library. We know library stuff. You, this is, if you know, I rarely talked about library things only in the context of an example. Find a mentor outside of the library world who is a manager, leader, um, you know, who maybe is at that C-suite level. Talk to your chamber of commerce, talk to your HR department so you can meet somebody in another department. Um, but I think that is key. I've had some really great mentors in my life. Um, I've worked outside of libraries. I worked at the Federal Reserve Bank. I worked for the city of Baltimore. Um, and those places offered me the opportunity to meet and interface with some really fantastic leaders and mentors. So um, if you need help with that, um, there are places you can go to find a mentor. And I, I really encourage you to do so. Um, find your confidence. That's the fake it till you make it part, right? Um, just by nature of your job title, you come with with this authority. Um, so own it, um, even if you don't, even if you don't feel it, still own it. Okay. Um, if you if they, it's like it's like dealing with teens, right? When you're in the teen space, they can smell fear. So you have got to know who you are. No one to hold them. No one to fold them. Right? Own it. Um, you keep learning and growing. I'm doing it all the time. Um, you're going to get new staff. There's there's organizational culture. There's cross cultural competencies. Um, you you know you're going to get um, somebody who is not who is the opposite of you um, who's going to challenge you. So be willing to learn and grow. Find lots of ways to say you're sorry without saying you're sorry because I'm I'm rarely sorry because you know you messed up. I don't want to mess up. I do mess up. So I do apologize when I need to. But when I apologize, I mean it and people realize it because I know lots of ways to say, gosh, that sounds really hard. And it sounds like you don't have the tools that you need. And we're going to work on that. I could have easily said, I'm sorry that you, you know, I'm sorry. No, don't always feel like you have to apologize. Just write down lots of different ways, find out lots of different ways to say no, find out lots of different ways to say that you're sorry um, and write them down and put them in your pocket. Um, I, I think anytime you go through anything with your staff, debrief and reflect what went wrong, what could you have done better? What do you wanna do for next time? What did you miss? Um, slow down. I tell my staff a lot, no one is performing brain surgery today. Um, patrons can wait. Staff can wait. Um, we put a lot of pressure on ourselves and we don't have to. Um, I had a lady, I was working the desk yes, yesterday. I don't remember, my days are coming together. No, two days ago. She had all her little newspaper clippings from all the books she wanted on hold. Oh, great, okay. Made a photocopy, wrote down her, wrote down her library card number, handed it back. I'm going to work on these and we'll make sure those get placed for you today. She didn't need to stand there while I did all that. I got to, I took my little piece of paper and did it later, right? Slow down, take your time, forgive yourself. I screw up all the time, but I'm coming from a good place. And so I'm harder on myself than anyone could ever be. Um, so this is, I'm put saying this as much for me as anybody else. I'm going to, I'm going to beat myself up about all of the things I wanted to tell everyone and didn't get to. I had paid, like, I had all this stuff for you guys. So, you know, but I got to be like, you know what? I, I in the moment, um, I shared what I could. 
Um, there'll be more opportunities for these sorts of things. And please, please, please do not lose who you are, why you are here, your passion about your work in this process. Um, you're here because there is something that you have innately or, or that your administration saw in you that brought you here, right? So don't lose that. Um, it is easy to get burnt out in this process. It is easy to sort of lose that, you know, inner strength or that well of joy. Trust me. Um, so please try not to lose that. You are not being of benefit to your staff if you um, lose yourself in this process. So um, this is a wonderful opportunity. Um, I am thrilled that you've taken it. Um, it's exciting for our profession to have people um, sort of move up and grow. And so congratulations to the new folks. Um, thank you for investing in yourself um, to come to this session. Um, and, you know, if you need anything, please email me. Um, I don't have my phone number on there because my phone situation is weird. But please email me. Um, if, you, if you are getting ready to have a difficult conversation with a staff person and you need some you know, you need somebody to bounce ideas off of, call me. I love that kind of stuff. Um, everybody thinks I'm weird, but I almost love confrontation. I'm the person that they're like, you know, the computer lab in DC folks would always call, can you come down and talk to this angry? Yes, I can come down and talk to that angry patron. I would love to. So, um, and I know that that's not something a lot of people um, like doing. So I'm happy to sort of break down your, your um, crucial conversation. So, um, love some of the chats in here. Always want my employees to be happy. Yeah, whether it's with me, with me or not, whether it's in libraries or not. Um, yeah, right. Yeah, there's the chat is really great. So I'm sorry I missed some of that. Um, I know it's we're coming up on 11, but um, anybody have any, like I wanted more time for questions. So I'm sorry I kind of rambled. I do that sometimes. My staff can attest. Um, any final questions or Amelia, anything you think I ought to retouch on? Can I scroll down more? There we go. You're welcome, Alan. I would read your long minutes, So feel free to put in questions in chat or unmute yourself. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Unmute. That would be great. I will, I will get a resource list together for you guys, but you know, in forgiving myself, I didn't, I didn't quite get to it. It's been a rough week. Oh, good. I'm glad it was helpful. Oh, yay, Marissa. I'll come back and visit. If you come back to your hometown, come back and visit. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Difficult conversation yesterday. Yeah, man, forgive yourself, debrief on it. And next time you'll be ready next time. Yeah. Yeah, I think we need to have like a coaching and counseling disciplinary action session, um, several. We probably need like a, a, a group that meets every month to just sort of like, okay, what happened? You know, because it, it is personal. And it, I hate it when, when staff are like, get emotional. That's not what anybody wants, but you know, it's important work. Mm. Oh, good, good. Um, yeah, I like to bring real world stuff, right? Because that's the only way it makes sense. There's a question. Any good resources or creative ways to say sorry? Do you just Ooh. your own or did you find that somewhere? You know, I, I know it's my own. Sometimes it's just like, okay, I'm sorry. It's such a throwaway line that I really try to think, okay, what do I really want to say? Because I'm, I'm not really sorry. Um, <clears throat> what did it, you know, you know, it's that. It just, it, crucial conversations really helped with that, I think. I think that was the one where I really learned that phrasing is important. And so, you know, it, it sounds like you, you're having a difficult time dealing with um, moving. Like, oh, you know, I've moved and the new commute and that, you know, that disruption can be, can be tough. Um, so a lot of times, instead of finding a new way to say, I'm sorry, it's more, I'm gonna rephrase what they've said so that they know that I heard them, right? Um, so, that, that's kind of what I'm doing in my head. I'm just like, okay, I'm, you know, so, so, so the move is what really has prompted this change in your arrival time. Yeah, um, moving is stressful. It's difficult. It, it's a disruption to your routine. 
I hear it. Yeah, I hear that. I've gone through that too. So we'll give it a, we'll give it another week and, and see if you, you know, how you adjust to the change and we'll reevaluate your attendance next week. Right. I never said I was sorry, <laughs> but they feel, but they feel like that I understand their circumstance. So, Ooh, maybe that's the book I need to write. Yeah. 100 ways to say sorry without saying you're sorry. All right, folks. Well, we are at time. So thank you so much, Leslie, for this presentation. Oh, thank you, guys. Thank you for coming. I really appreciate you taking time out of your busy day. 